you know, they, they, did, they did not have any business or life experience other than that which they got in, in college or in their young personal experience. You know, they're in their 20s. And so uh, the, uh, the knowledge of uh, business, liability, land location, ownership, um, acquisition of materials, uh, labor, uh, uh, cooperation with state and federal governments, uh, all of those things were unknown to them. What they had in their, in, their, in their mind was the creativity, the creative process. They wanted to make the art, and they wanted to make the art. Uh, they wanted to start their own dialogue, which with Heiser, his dialogue starts out with an objection to the eternal rectangle, the size and shape that art has to take to fit in a gallery or to fit in someone's home or the museum. And he, re he was rejecting that. He felt that... And he said to me at one time, art has no limits. There should be no limits. It should be, should, should, should be as large as you want it to be and to involve the entire earth. And so to do that, you start to involve yourself with a lot of people because you have the people who control the land or who own it. And the amount of money required to create the work goes up because of the size and the materials and labor requirements and so forth. So what I found myself doing was becoming a facilitator by meeting Michael Heiser and Walter De Maria and, and, and all of the other young up and coming uh, members of the new movement, Art Povera, the minimalist and conceptual movement. By starting to meet them, I found myself being asked to use my own skills as a businessman, as a pilot, as a photographer, as a land locator, as a person who knew business and had connections with major corporations, not for fundraising, but to actually management. Management that you, you would require in order for you to re make a realization of your project. You want to do a large earthwork. Well, you're going to need the land. You're going to have to look at the legality. You're going to have to buy it. Otherwise, why build it? You have no right to it. You have to own it. You know, all of these things uh, involve processes and uh, knowledge that most young artists don't have. Yeah. They don't have the experience. So I became a facilitator. And this I enjoyed very much. And I didn't make it a business. My background was uh, casino gaming and then aviation, where I was an airline transport rated pilot, but a particular type of aviation because my aviation required me to, to do a lot of what we call um, off-field work. In other words, rough field landings, water landings, flying both small and large aircraft and helicopters. And so I was engaged by the Hughes Tool Company as Mr. Hughes is director of aviation facilities. So I had a very extensive aviation background. What that brought to the art world was my ability to transport you or to put you over a site or to put you on the ground at the site and also to be able to bring materials or men or equipment in and out of a remote site and also to actually know what the land looked like because if you flew, it flew like I did thousands of hours in the west I knew what valleys looked like or which mountain range was here or was there. So that was a body of knowledge that I also had. And that's actually what I was doing when I first met Michael Heiser and Walter De Maria and, and the others. And, and on top of that, then, I uh, had a background where I had been purchasing real estate myself for investment. And because of my work with Mr. Hughes, with the Hughes Tool Company, it gave me a knowledge of corporations and their structure and liability and all of the business things that affect whatever you do. So with that knowledge, that's what I brought, brought to the party. I brought that business knowledge and the, uh, the visual knowledge of the, the West the locations, and, and, and then whatever creativity I had myself, I actually liked the idea of 
conceptual art, minimalism. I'm, 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 how many people have know, would have known Joseph Boyce, you know, at that time? Yeah, yeah. And, and it was something that uh, in, uh, inspired me and made me interested. It was fun to know these people. And they did, they went out of their way after they engaged me, and I did this for free. I didn't charge money. I did this because I liked to, but they responded by educating me further. <laughs> They would make sure that I met the museum director or curator or dealers, you know, Heiner Friedrich here or Virginia Dwan or, or um, we can name, you name the old dealers in, in New York. I met them all. And other artists, Frank Stella, you know, you can name the whole group of, of young artists at that time. So they gave me an education. They gave me an art education. I gave them a business <laughs> education. <laughs> At that time, when I first became aware of earth sculpture as a movement or land art, whatever you wanted to call it, it had no name at that time. It was Michael's response in almost, uh, he was depressed and he had done nine Nevada depressions. As a young artist, he had done nine very small pieces along the California Nevada border. Some of them no bigger than a coffee table. Uh, little incisions in the ground and rift for instance, done on a dry lake that was less than several hundred feet long. He had started to think large. He had started to think large, and he had made some contacts in northern Nevada with Earl Casaza, who was a owner of a large trucking company. He had made some uh, contact with him because Michael wanted to do a large stone move, removal piece. He called it Displaced replaced mass and he had already started that when he met me what happened was I was working at the airport in my offices at the main airport here for Mr. Hughes and I heard Jeffrey Gates an individual come to the to the office to ask to charter an airplane because they wanted to go look at an artwork and the girl at the at the counter I overheard her say to him, no, we can't allow our airplanes to be used for that purpose. <clears throat> but when he said art, that got my interest, so I went to the, the counter and met him. And he told me about Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria and this new movement involving the earth. And I was very interested. And furthermore, my curiosity, when he said he was there to look, to find the nine Nevada depressions that Michael had done, which included powder dispersal pieces on Coyote Dry Lake. And he mentioned this one piece. He says he's done a work where he's removed some dirt on a dry lake, but I don't know where it is. And I said, well, I, I have an idea where I would go if I was going to do such a work. And I said, I'll fly you. And so I took Jeff Gates and we flew south of Las Vegas to the very first dry lake south of Las Vegas, which is called Gene Dry Lake. And if, if you want to, I mention now that this is the same area that I located for Ugo Rondonone. Because, uh, and before that, uh, this, I didn't know it, but Gene Dry Lake had been used by Tingley uh, several years before I ever met Jeff Gates. I didn't even know it. So I flew toward Gene Dry Lake and from 5,000 feet up and several miles away, I could see that it had been disturbed, that there was a line in it, like a lightning bolt. And so I told Jeff, I said, I think I see it already. And he looked and looked, and it, sure enough, we flew over it, and there it was, rift, R-I-F-T, rift. And it just uh, excited me like nothing. I, I, I just really, it, it touched my heart. It, you know, it really touched my heart. <laughs> My heart. So I said, we'll land. <laughs> so we landed on the, on the dry lake and got out. And I actually walked up to it and Jeff was excited. And he says, I'm, when I go back to New York, I'm going to tell Michael that I, I, so forth. And it wasn't too long after that, that Heiser contacted me and came to Las Vegas and we met and we started this long-term relationship, which lasted over 30 years became very close. 
He ta uh, told me what he wanted to do. He introduced me to Walter, who also came out. He introduced, he asked me to come to New York and meet other people, Virginia Duan. His dealer at that time, I believe was Heiner Friedrich, uh, uh, he was working with, and uh, an Italian dealer, I've forgotten his name. And so I started to uh, become involved and Michael began to tell me, I want to do these works. And he began to explain his, his dialogue, his conversation. Which, which is what an artist is. It's a conversation, as you know, between the artist and you. If the artist says this, and you see it, and you understand it, good. If he does it again, or she does it again, and you further understand, ah, now this is important. If they can do it three times in a row, three different works, and each time it's a, 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 it continues a conversation, then you're, you are, you are a real artist. You are starting... Uh, you're becoming important. You're, you're uh, adding to man's intelligence and knowledge and experience. And that's what Michael Heiser gave me, he gave me that, that idea, that knowledge, that, that uh, what I was doing was important and I enjoyed it and I knew what he was trying to do. So I was on his side. <laughs> so it, it, brought me into yeah. the, it brought me into the game. So then he uh, made known his other requirements. And then I told him the problems he was going to have. And I told and, and Walter and all of them, I said, you can't go around digging holes and things and moving things and, and doing this and, and it's going to cost a lot of money and you're going to have to have those business uh, associations, organizations and, and uh, uh, vehicle in order to do this. And they asked me, will you help? Of course. And I, and I enjoyed it. So w immediately I began to site locate double negative. And one of the important things that, it, that hasn't really been discussed before is that Michael did not envision double negative before the land. He had to have seen the land first. He saw the land first and then he made the conception, the decision on how to use the land and the, and the uh, structure of double negative. So it was a matter of which came first, the chicken or the egg? And in this case, the land came first, and then his, he envisioned his creativity. He envisioned what he was going to do with it, because the land was impossible. When I found this land, I tried to get the cheapest land I could find. And I had a friend who owned some land as part of a scheme to sell junk land to people out of state. And I asked him how much, and he told me seventeen fifty an acre. That's seventeen dollars and fifty cents an acre. Impossible. And I said, "Where is it?" He says, "Out on Mormon Mesa," because Michael had said he wanted it as remote as possible. He didn't care. He wanted it as far away from people as possible. He wanted to do his works with as much security, uh, no power lines, no roadways, no no people. And this was perfect because it was almost inaccessible. And so we, we ended up ending, I think it was 20 acres, or maybe 25 acres, half of which was on the face of a mesa, and the other was on top. You couldn't even walk on half of it. You'd fall down, it was a cliff. So then I flew Michael out and showed it to him, and he, I like it, he said. Maybe it was at that time that he yeah. got his envisionment, but he had never seen that dirt before. Then I brought him in on the ground. And also about that time, Walter De Maria, I told Walter, I said, if we're going to do this work in the desert, and Walter was also wanting to do earthworks. And I helped him with uh, Las Vegas piece, line drawing, later in uh, uh, Lightning Field, Munich Mountain, other works, quite a few works for Walter. With uh, Walter is working at the same time using me as Michael. And it was interesting because it was a competition between the two of them. And it was also a competition for location. Walter was a more effete, more, more feminine, you know, not, not in the terms of sexuality, but more, more light, more, less masculine, less cowboy, less strength, less big, you know, less massive. You know how Michael likes massive, Masses, he calls them, levitated mass, displaced mass. Walter was doing spike beds 
you know, and working in small uh, stainless steel and chrome. And it was a little lighter touch with, with Walter, a little different conversation, a little different language. But he would come to Nevada and he wanted to do earthworks too. But his earthworks weren't, didn't involve movement of large quantities of dirt. Rather, he painted on the dirt or he drew on the dirt like the cover of Art Povera uh, book, one of the seminal books about uh, earthworks, Art Povera, P-O-V-E-R-A. The photo on the front, uh, the flyleaf, the, the book cover is, Mike, uh, is Walter Di Maria laying on his back on the dry lake with a long white chalk line. And I did that chalk line because they didn't know how to make a, a straight white chalk line. So we used, in those days, the marker that you use for soccer or football field. You know, you put the chalk in, you yeah, yeah. move it along. So I was working for both of them and trying to be loyal with both of them and not discussing concepts between each other and trying to keep them away from each other. And they knew it and they didn't care. They had no idea. They were living off of small work. They were living off of uh, their gallery work and their private collector work. Uh, Michael with his uh, paintings, started with shape paintings and his uh, bullet violence series. These were all works of sculpture that could be made in a studio and moved to someone's studio or gallery or museum or house. They would take that money and private money and try to build the larger works in the earth. Walter de Marine was doing the same thing. He, he, he was, uh, uh, he never really, he never really tried to buy anything in the, in the West. He never tried to buy land. He saw how expensive it was and he went in a different direction. After we started and I did the work for, for Michael and we, he realized we were talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I injured myself building a complex one, the, uh, the complex one where uh, the series of concrete, engineered concrete uh, elements, which when viewed from quite a distance out, they form together into a, into a perfect rectangle full of dirt. And this is a statement on the eternal rectangle yeah. and art. Genius, genius work. Well, that was the first thing we tried to build in the desert. He tried to build in the desert. Nothing could be harder than what he picked because it required sophisticated engineering by a firm in, in the Bay Area of, of, of the United States called Goplin and Yokoyama. And it had to be built in the desert where there was no water. The concrete had to be brought in in truckloads, huge, huge truckloads, and mixed on site you know, and equipment had to be bought, cement mixers and loaders and, 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 and personnel. Who are you going to get to work uh, two and a half hours north of Las Vegas in the middle of the desert, you know, living in a tent or in a trailer? I mean, these are, these are the problems that had to be solved. It was interesting because the nearest town, if you could call it a town, had less than 300 people and was 65 miles of desert, no paved road, but that's where the nearest people were. And these people were of the Mormon religion and most of them were ranchers, cowboys, farmers. They knew nothing about art. They, art was a natural thing, like, a, like a, a landscape to them was art or a portrait. Their idea of conceptualism or minimalism or modern art or abstract art was beyond them. They, they, they knew nothing of it. So I realized, and they were suspicious. Now you've got this guy from New York and another guy from Las Vegas who are up there going to build something, an artwork in the middle of the desert. I mean, 65 miles away in the middle of nowhere and north of the test site where they blow the atomic bomb. What's going on here? There's a lot of suspicion, paranoia. So I went to Michael and I said, 
We're going to need these people. You're going to need them because this is where you're going to buy your gasoline. This is where you're going to get your, your, your uh, personnel. This is where you may be able to buy equipment. We ended up buying horses from them even. So I said, why don't I do this? We make a presentation. I will use this, the, the high school auditorium and I will invite all the people in the area to come to the auditorium and see a slideshow. I make a slideshow and I will explain to them what is modern art, abstract art, and a little bit about conceptual art and minimalist art, and about you and what you're doing. So now they'll know what you're doing and it will take away all the paranoia and, 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 and we'll get some cooperation. He said, okay, let's do it. So we sat down, he and I together, and we picked slides to be shown in those days and uh, different uh, things that he had done, starting from small pieces like the works that he did in Amsterdam uh, in the sidewalk, all the way through to double negative. And I did, I put out a little information, I went to the county uh, board, I went to the uh, officials, and we had the, 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 the meeting, and lo and behold, everybody came. I mean, they brought the babies, they bought the dogs, they brought everybody. The whole area turned out, these small town farmers and ranchers and cowboys, they all came. Teachers from the school, they came from the small school, one, one room schoolhouse. And they all came and crowded into the auditorium on folding chairs. And I had the projector and the slide, and so I gave a dissertation, a simple presentation on what was art, what was the, was the artist trying to say? You didn't have to like everything you saw. You have taste. You have uh, your own desires of what you like to see and what you don't. Does this appeal to you? Does it say anything to you? And when I got done, we got a standing ovation and everybody was excited. And from that day on, Michael Heiser has become their artist. They act like he, they own him. <laughs> they are very proud of him, and they protect him. And then, of course, over the years, we hired them. We, we, we created jobs. We spent money. People came from Europe to visit Michael. Michael lived there. He became a resident. He built a, a, a ranch house, and he grew uh, hay, and he got water rights, and, and uh, he owned cattle, as well as building one of the largest works of art, land art in the world. And these people know him and love him, and they really appreciate what he's doing. And they can give you a pretty good discussion of, of modern art, if you ask them. <laughs>
or every he, he controls that he wants to that's his that's his mystique so to have me go out and say anything uh, is disloyal to him he felt it was disloyal that it was some kind of self-aggrandizement even though I charge no money for my services and I, I could have you know very easily you know I did this as a avocation I did it because I liked it and I never took credit uh, at any time you don't see my name uh, in, but very rarely do you ever see anything about Michael Heiser where it mentions me a couple of times uh, he mentions me or if you talk to him privately. So when I went and became sick, I was very ill and I wondered what should I do with all of this? I had works that he had given me. Uh, you know, I'd had uh, some sculpture, I had some drawings, I had all of these files, all uh, the information that you'd seen, photography that I'd kept. And, and it's much deeper than what we've spoken about here. There are many other things that I did with Michael that, that helped uh, his location and, and uh, the ability for him to do what he did. And I kept all of that material and I, wasn't, I didn't want to throw it away. I thought that it was important. I felt that when he died and when I died that uh, maybe somebody would want to go back and know, you know that it would contribute to someone's education. I knew that was going to happen, but there was nowhere to put it. So when they opened the museum and I found out that they were going to do what they were going to do, it was natural for me to offer the material that I, the ephemera and memorabilia that I had to them. And I very, and I did it and, 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 and it was a gift from my wife and I, and it took a big load off my mind because my children weren't interested. You know, nobody else in my family other than my wife even knew really about it. But it made Michael very, very uh, paranoid, very upset because he was afraid that I would divulge something that he didn't want said. He didn't realize that I loved him and that I cared about his work. And he, he did, but he, was, he, was, he, he doesn't trust people that much. You know what I mean? And so that broke our friendship up to the point where we haven't talked to each other since we yelled at each other on the phone. We haven't talked to each other for a couple of years because he's still angry and I'm angry. Yeah. It's amazing. And now Walter, our dear friend Walter, has passed away. Walter never said a word about, he was very cooperative about, didn't bother him that I had given the early, the very first drawing of, uh, of Lightning Field, the very first one done on a cocktail napkin for me, with me in the coffee shop of the Stardust. He didn't care. Walter, Walter didn't seem to have that kind of paranoia. Siva was the first corporate, when I, when I explained to, to Michael, I said, you've got to have some kind of corporate uh, shield, corporate uh, vehicle, uh, uh, an identity that keeps it off of you personally. I said, because if something bad happens, you know, then, then they would sue or they would go after the corporation. Also, it will give you a more serious presence if, if I'm going and I'm negotiating for a piece of machinery or if I'm going to uh, represent you or something, saying, well, you know, uh, represent Siva Corporation, sounds better. So I said, you should have the corporation for all those reasons. And his advisors uh, uh, agreed, his dealers, and, and if he had, at the time he had been involved in divorces, he had an attorney and so forth. So he named it after the Indian tribe that is located on the lower uh, below Ma Lake Mojave on the Colorado River, the Chemehuevaya Indians. So he abbreviated it to Siva, C-I-V-A Corporation. And he liked it. It made him feel more solid. It, 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 it encouraged him that uh, we had the helmets with Siva Corporation and we could put it on the trucks. He, he, it, it, I think, uh, bolstered his ego, bolstered his presence. What, what would occur in the creative process was that Michael would tell me rough outline of his idea, 
not so much what the work would look like, but what he, what he, what he wanted as far, we would think of the land as a canvas. And I would think the same way. And I would think about the sight lines. I would think about what was near it, what could be seen from it. And so the location was important to me. And what I knew it, I'd flown so many thousands of hours over the Western United States that I had a good idea of what the geography of the West looked like. So like for double negative, when I went to look at the land, I flew over it first and realized where it was located and saw that it had this beautiful panorama that no matter what you did on the Mesa, the view would be unmolested over the centuries. Nobody would ever change it. So you could rely upon it. And the same thing with the city, the location of the city. He told me that it had to be, uh, it, that he was dealing with something that might be a mile long, that we would need, and this, this would involve sections of land, because a section is a mile square. And he wanted as much land as he could get, and he wanted to acquire all of the private land that might be close to it. And so this limited, in Nevada, for instance, only 13% of the land in Nevada is privately owned. The rest of it's owned by the United States government, and you're not going to get it. And it's controlled by the Bureau of Land Management. Well, luckily, I found three sections of land contiguous to each other, like an L shape. So that would make it two miles long on two square sides. This was enough land. And in the middle of a pristine valley, it didn't even have a road into it. And there were no housing, no people, no power, no water, no nothing. And facing a 10,000 foot mountain range. And very hard to get to. Take four wheel drive to get to it. So one of the first things we did after we located it, and I flew him there, I four wheel drived him there in Walter's truck. And we have a picture standing on a dirt road of the day that we went out to locate it. He and I standing together, it's in the archive. He wanted, it was all part of the mystique surrounding uh, his creation of of uh, you of mystery of mystery about him or a mystery about his work or it also involved the size the very size of the work like you don't put Machu Picchu in Mexico City or in Caracas you put it out and it, it was built in the middle of nowhere or Uxmal, or, or, or Ichichen Itza. You know, he had been exposed to the remoteness of different areas of the earth where man had created large earth, earth works of art and cities. And he wanted to do the same thing. This is not something that's possible to be done near an urban area. First of all, be too expensive. And second of all, you'd, you'd have a housing track built next to you. So the idea of the location is very important. The remoteness is extremely important. And, and that provides the protection and the space. It also, it's hard to, if you're doing a work like what Michael is in the earth, or like um, um, uh, Roden Crater, you know, it has to be done. They all took a, a, a a clue off of Michael. It has to be done where it can remain remote and use the space as part of the work. You know, that valley becomes part of the city because nothing else can go in it. So when you go to the work, it becomes, all of it becomes part of the art. You involve the whole land that's available.
It's interesting that you bring that up because I, I made a presentation at the Nevada Museum of Art during the, uh, I think it was the first conference of the Center for Earth and the Environment. And at that presentation, uh, a woman, uh, an art reporter or historian, asked me very pointedly about the environmental concerns of, uh, of, of building art at that time and so forth. And I had to remind her that we were talking about 1967, 68, 69, 70. Nobody talked about the environment back then. There was no such thing as the EPA or environmental protection. There was no desert tortoise, turtle amelioration. There was no consideration. We utilized the land. We manipulated the land. We used the land. And we weren't responsible to anyone but ourselves for what we did to the land. It's only recently, in the last years, that men and women, uh, that, that people have become concerned about the environment and how you would use it. They, would know, they wouldn't let Robert Smithson do spiral jetty now in the Salt Lake. They wouldn't, uh, you know, and that is another reason uh, that, well, I'll give you an idea. The whole of Gene Dry Lake, which we are now about to construct facing it, Ugo Rondenone's Seven Magic Mountains, right? And Ugo and I went together into the desert. He had never been into the desert. And so he asked me first, I was retained, to look for where to put this. And I kept coming back to Jean Dry Lake because for many reasons. But now I have to also take into consideration we now have the EPA, we now have the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, we now have the railroad company, we now have the Federal Highway Department, we now have all of these agencies have control over the land that's in that area. And they're all going to have to permit it or approve it or discuss it, and any one of them could stop it. But back in the old days, Michael went down to the lake drove out on it, and dug it up. And I t when I found out that he did that, something went off in my head back in 1970. And I said, you know, I think I'll go to the BLM and lock it up. And so do you know we were able to lease that whole dry lake for $50 a year? And he used it to draw um, circumflex on, isolated circumflex, uh, they were able to do artworks and, 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 and the surface. We had it. it. We leased it. You couldn't do that now. Now it's multiple use and controlled by the government. And it has signs and access and gates. And, and now they are fighting that process, fighting it. They are going through that lengthy, expensive process with the federal government and all the other agencies for UGO to get that approved, or it's not going to get built. The Bill Fox at, the, at the, the Center for Earth and the Environment knew me very well and had uh, stayed with Michael, and, and so they, he, he knew my qualifications. And when Art Production Fund in New York uh, decided that they were going to uh, have Ugo do a piece in southern Nevada so that uh, the Center for Earth and the Environment would have a, a complete statewide presence. And they also knew that there was a lot of money, I think, available in southern Nevada, that there were people here that were willing to become involved in modern art that hadn't been approached by anybody legitimate. So at that time, he mentioned me to Art Production Fund, to those, the three ladies who, are, uh, who operate it, and they met with me and they decided, he and Ann Wolf and David Walker, the uh, director of the museum, decided that I would be the right person to site locate and perhaps uh, do uh, some initial uh, cost analysis, uh, const uh, contract construction contracting, and I did. So they retained me and they paid me to, to do that work. So what I did was I worked with Yugo and picked out several areas first so that Ugo could look at them. 
And he and I became friendly. He's in, in, northern, in northern Italian, and Swiss, and from Switzerland, so am I, northern Italian. So we got along very well. And he finally just looked at me and said, you, you locate it. I will, I will like it anywhere that, that, that is here. Made me feel very good. So then I looked at it from the business standpoint, access. Could it be accessible to the public so that they could see it? Could it be seen from where the most people travel, which is the freeway? And who controlled the land and could we lease it? And then who would build it? Which co company? Which, what would be the right company that would provide this kind of material that we need? And so I selected three companies and had them each bid on the project. Then I reported to Art Production Fund and to David and to Anne my progress. And they came down several times to look. And Ugo came back. And at that also they went about their business of finding out how it was going to be uh, financed. And I believe they were successful. So quite recently they had a soft opening where they invited some very important people, the right people, in Las Vegas to come on board to assist with the financing and uh, so forth. But I had already gone to the governor and to the head of the BLM and to the head of uh, the different agencies in the county and so forth. So we'd smoothed it over already. And that was the same thing that I did with Michael Heiser and Walter De Maria and so forth. So I just did the same thing. Very happy to do it. And it looks like it's going to move forward. And it will be the first large earthwork that's close to an urban area where people will, can easily see it. It's not easy to go and see double negative or the lightning field or the city. It's hard. But this one, every day, 40,000 people will go by on the freeway and say, what's that? And so it will, it will bring a different uh, exposure of contemporary art to the citizens. It will, and it will be economically the governor recently appointed me to a committee that handles the distribution of uh, the National Endowment of the Arts money. And he is very much interested in art if it, if it helps the economy of Nevada. And this artwork will certainly help the economy of the state of Nevada because not only are they going to spend a lot of money building it, employing people, but many tourists and art aficionados and people who know about it are going to come to see it. So it works. I think it'll be a big success. Now, how will it be as an artwork? I leave that to the critics. <laughs> For instance, double negative uh, for many years, people would come from, from Europe and from Asia, and I would take them to it. Michael would, yeah, they would contact Michael, or he would call and say that somebody from France, somebody from Germany, or somebody from New York, or somebody would be coming out, and would I guide them? So I became the tour guide. For about 30 years, I brought people from all over the world to go and see Double Negative. So still, it, the, the audience is generally those people who become associated with art, contemporary art, because of their education. But the actual person on the street, my next door neighbor, doesn't have a clue. The, act, the, the, the resident of Las Vegas, in Nevada, the very board that I work on, Nevada Art Council, the Nevada Council, they don't know a thing about earth art or Ugo's work, they are still locked in art as a, uh, what you would call almost primitive, basket weaving, cowboy poetry, finger painting, uh, folkloric or folk, folk life, folklore art. But as far as the avant-garde is concerned, they know nothing of the avant-garde. It's really interesting. They have no knowledge whatsoever. Very few people in Nevada and who come to Nevada have any uh, uh, knowledge of the avant-garde.
th this would result in great, uh, what would you call it, debate. Yes. There would be a tremendous debate. There would be tremendous publicity associated with the Seven Magic Mountains piece because it is not an easy piece for even me to resolve. And I'm thinking of it like an introductory, introductory piece, like a, almost like a, hello, I have an artwork. You know what I mean? That's what I think it's going to say to people who are going to ask the, the great unwashed. The great unwashed are going to say, and there'll be thousands, tens of thousands of them that pass this work every day. And they're going to say, most of them are going to say, what in the hell is that? You know, and so this is going to create an interest and a conversation and an, an argument. I know that there's going to be an argument about, because this town, this area, has been very ignorant, at my personal opinion, as living here and being here all my life. Their concept of art is not an educated one. They have neglected it. It's good that you mentioned this. Maybe it will get back to somebody. There's, there's been no re work to, re to, to stabilize it. Yes. It's dangerous. You could fall into it and get killed. The walls are collapsing. I won't allow, when I take people to see it, I won't allow them to stand near the edge or to go down into the slots because the sides have spalled off and thousands of tons of dirt have fallen in. And this is terrible. They have not fenced it. They haven't uh, denied access. It's just been left there. And I heard that I... So in a few centuries, you won't even see it anymore. Michael himself has said, before we got in the argument, the last argument we had, he said that he was going to try to see if he couldn't get... Uh, it's stabilized, repaired, back to its natural state. But it's not been done. As late as last month, I saw it last month, it is an advanced state of deterioration, and like everything in the desert, will be reclaimed. It will eventually, it will eventually deteriorate to the point where it looks like everything else. No, I do not know this piece. This is an iteration of a piece that was originally done on Gene Dry Lake. It was done with a motorcycle. Did you see it? Yeah, it was yeah. It was done with pictures. a motorcycle. This is not real large, I don't think. It's quite big. I mean, one of the circles is big like the... Yeah, but it's not... By big, I mean <laughs> acres. <laughs> not, not, not in... It, this is not hundreds of meters. I don't believe this is hundreds of meters wide. I think this is... No, probably, it's like... It might uh, be a hundred uh, meters. 20, 20 Yeah, it's small, so, I can yeah. tell. But he has done it, I think, as much as 300 meters across with a motorcycle, exactly like this, with the tangential touching, of, but without the excavation, which is like rift. But this, I like the piece, it's very pretty, I like it. This is very interesting. Well, he's, done, he's done a great deal of work, that especially in, like in Reno, Nevada, you saw both pieces up there. He wasn't happy with perforated object, the piece they put in front of the federal building. And it, it doesn't work in front of that building, and he didn't like it. He didn't like the way they installed it in front of that building. In fact, I think they moved it. And then behind the building, there is another piece. There is the circle. So, yeah. yeah, and I don't like, I love the pieces. But this is an example of what happens when you make a transformation and it doesn't work when you made the transformation of the object into a large object. Then you put it in a small area. You see what I mean? And that, that's my problem, my personal problem with the piece in my own hometown. This, the, the, that should be in a... It, now the piece, the piece in uh, Southern California at, that he just installed, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mass yeah, yeah. down there. 
This is what I call the first piece to be OSHA approved. The, the Federal Agency Office of Safety and Health because he had to put, he had to put a chair railing, he had to put railings, and they had to put in all kinds of extra uh, load-bearing uh, surfaces because of the rock to make it safe for people to, to walk under it. You see what's happened? Now the artists don't have the freedom to do what they want to do, what they, what they wanted to do. There is a restriction now on the, the art size of art and where it can be placed. So is there something lost? It's is lost, it? yes. I think it's lost. Yes, yeah. You know, there should be... Life is not free of danger. Life is not free of risk. Why do we want to always make it that way? You know, it's amazing. And if you don't have an actual risk, then you imagine one. And this restricts human beings. Human beings should have the freedom, yes, to hurt themselves. Not to hurt others intentionally, but you should have the freedom. Yes, so it's huge risk. Every time you get in an airplane with me, it's a risk. <laughs> so to, to do what we did in flying, they, you can't, I can't do now. I could not do it now. Landing in the desert not on an airstrip, but just landing on dirt and having to look for rocks and bushes and so forth and to bring people in to do that or to fly in the mountains as we did looking for displaced, replaced mass or I forget what it was called up in the mountains in Montana. We almost crashed. Yes, it was dangerous. The work that Michael did down in that slot building double negative I wouldn't have gone, I didn't go down in there. I'd stand there and watch him. And he learned how to use a bulldozer and he learned dynamite. You can't buy, he used dynamite to blow the rocks. It's in the book, the book. Not me, I stood two miles away when he did that dynamite, but I bought it for him. I was able to buy it and buy the fuse, the time fuse and so on. Can't do that anymore. You have to have a license to do that. So building early earthworks, it killed Robert Smithson. Smithson is dead because of the pilot he hired. It's his fault. It's nobody else's fault. The pilot stalled the airplane at so low an altitude that it couldn't recover. Same thing with driving. Driving for hours or driving in the ice, driving in the snow, off, or being stuck in the desert. One night we were in the desert, Michael and I, before we were able to build anything, and it went to 20 degrees below zero, and we were not equipped to, to handle that. So you know what we did? We stayed up all night walking, back and forth, walking, back and forth, talking to each other until the sun could come up. And those days are gone. You know, those days are gone, you know.